Thank you for tuning in to today's full episode of the Breaking Changes podcast. I'm your host and chief evangelist for Postman, Ken Lane. With Breaking Changes, we explore specific topics from the world of APIs, but look at it through the lens of business and engineering leadership. Joining me today, we have Patrick Donahue, Vice President of Product for Application Security at Cloudflare. Patrick shared Cloudflare's vision of the API management layer that has become part of the fabric of the web, offering a very progressive view of how the API gateway fits into the business landscape and shared their really interesting approach to treating APIs as a product. Let's, let's dive in with the basics. Who are you and what do you do? Uh, great, great to be here. My name is Patrick Donahue. I work for a company called Cloudflare. Uh, Vice President of Product responsible for our application security products. So that's API security and management, web application firewall, rate limiting, all the kind of custom managed rules, DDoS, bot management, client side security, and, and threat intelligence. Nice. That's a nice mix. I would say I'm I'm very dependent on y'all for for not just things we do at Postman, but personally, like my entire uh DNS runs through y'all, um, increasingly my rules, my routing, um, all my firewall, all my encryption, and a lot of it I'm dependent on automating via your API. So I'm appreciative for all the work that you all do. Absolutely. And I, and I, and I love actually going to meetings with customers. I spend a lot of my time in, in meetings with customer, customers and, and oftentimes, especially if they haven't used us yet, uh, as a company, there's people in the room that, like yourself, are using us from a personal basis. And so they already know a bit about Cloudflare and you know, maybe we've stopped the DDoS attack to their site or you know made their DNS a little faster. Um, so great, great to speak with you on that. Uh, are you using Terraform uh, for managing Cloudflare, or how are you actually uh, uh, managing your, your property? So mine are mine's actually what I consider platform ops collections. So mm -hmm. Postman has a variety of ways where API client um, you can build little collections mm -hmm. that do different things, and so I I consider these as my operational level collections using your API. Oh. So I have them t dialed in and then I have environments for, you know, um, I have several domains I manage through y'all and different apps. And so I'll have different workspaces and suites of collections that I use, but it is very Terraform like it's just oh. not a full tear down or build. It's, it's yeah. more about configuration and optimization. So, and I was actually, so early days of Cloudflare, I've been at the company about seven years. I, I was, uh, a lot closer to the code than I am now, which is a good thing for, for the company and, and the stability of, of our operation. But uh, I was using Postman to uh, do a lot of our early testing. And so when we build products, uh, product managers are, you know, buck stops with us in terms of, uh, we don't have a QA team, which, which was surprising to me at first. And then sort of, I realized I was coming from FinTech and then I got into it and I realized, you know, that that makes a lot of sense. And we have millions of, of free customers that are do a lot of QA for us. But I was using Postman to uh, kind of move through API calls and, and test things. And so a lot of the products, when we first build them, the early adopters just they don't care about the dashboard. Right. They're, they're trying to do things at scale and they want to make. Um, you know, hundreds of thousands of, of API calls uh, on a daily basis to uh, configure Cloudflare, create new properties. Um, take uh, uh, Postman for example. You have you have shop.postman.com, right? That that is a that is powered by Shopify on the back end. Shopify is making API calls to us to sort of provision that host name and and you know get an SSL certificate for it, and so. Um, those sorts of companies that have really strong, you know, engineering organizations, they, they don't care about the dashboard, right? They, they want to control everything via API. Yeah. And, and Postman, first and foremost, is known as an API client, second as a, as a testing uh, tool. Mm -hmm. But that automation that's come along with testing is what's really saved me as far as, because I, I can create a collection for a specific mm -hmm. purpose and it's documented and, like, I just don't have the memory uh, brain cells I used to when I was younger. So I can, you know, learn part of the Cloudflare API to do a specific uh, DNS thing that I need to dial it all in, document as a collection. It runs. 
um, I have the domain and the other, the zone stuff kind of abstracted away so I can use it across different zones and different domains. Mm -hmm. And, and then that's there in a workspace and I forget that knowledge and I go back about my business. I come back and it's all documented and I can have that scheduled. I can have it as a part of a pipeline. And so it's really just kind of is my memory about how things work. Cause I mean, I can't keep up with what y'all are building sometimes. Cause like, we, we, we I like mean, to I, keep our velocity high. Uh, and, yeah. Yeah. And so uh, we like to we like to be shipping. That's that's fun. You know, at the end of the day, as a as a product person, you want to put new things out there and solve customer problems. Um, speaking of, of sort of like your collections for documentation, I remember using is it, is it Newman, your CLI? Is, yeah. it, is it still what it's yeah. called? I, as, a, as a Seinfeld yeah. fan, I appreciate the, uh, the name. <laughs> of the and so we would write, you know, collections and build them in um, and run them in Docker containers to, to sort of run through full end to end mm -hmm. tests, you know, or making a new release and uh, making sure nothing regressed or things like that. Yeah. And I do that. I have that where I'll, like I have, there's a couple domains that I are a real heavy subdomain. Um, I mean, there's literally a couple hundred subdomains and it's a very distributed architecture, but I have collections that will audit that mm -hmm. and, and use the, the Cloudflare API to get latest configurations, kind of test what's going on and make sure it's all set up and working. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's pretty robust and automated in the way that it helps me kind of keep tabs of, uh, pretty sprawling distributed landscape within a domain mm -hmm. and, it, and it helps me automate across that and, and ensure quality and governance and stuff like that. So that's great. And one of the things we, we tell our teams is if you're in the dashboard, you can, you can see, you know, there's a button you can click, but there's a little drawer beneath it and you can click that and it'll show you the underlying API call. And so we try mm -hmm. to make it as easy as possible to do that. And then, in a lot of cases, and some of the new stuff we're building, it'll interpolate, you know, what you've typed in into the API call so that you can actually uh, just copy and paste it and, and not worry about that. Uh, I've, worry about I've written to... about that probably two or three times, and I've res referenced it in probably about 30 or 40 conversation or talks that I've given that right. specific co API call because yeah. I, I'm a, like, that for me is – is how UI should be. It's like, mm -hmm. uh, give me what's the API behind every UI action that I need and put it right there for me. And so you guys are really that poster child of doing it well in my book. And, and that's great to hear. And, and it, what makes it easier is if you, and, and a lot of the companies that I talk to and, and you know, especially those adopting our API management solution, which we recently announced, uh, are their, their front ends are essentially just lightweight wrappers around the APIs that their customers are calling you know, to manage their properties that don't want to use the dashboard. And so that's, that's how we build as well. And so it, it makes it relatively easy um, to, to do that, you know, when, when you're just wrapping the, um, the APIs in, in the dashboard to make it makes it easy to show that. Yeah, no, it's the way it's the, it's the world as I see it, but I'm API biased, obviously. Um, but <laughs> you touched on, you, you kind of brought it home to why I wanted to jump on this call with you and, yeah. and have a conversation. I mean, I, for me, Cloudflare is just, you know, I get DNS out of, mm -hmm. I spent decades in DNS hell and the way that you guys have all simplified DNS for me, like, I'm like, I'll never go back to that reality. Like, I <laughs> just like you guys own, have been uh, buying oh, server or what did, what did you do? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I and I had my own. I had multiple C blocks back in the 90s and 2000s. Oh, wow. I had, you know, I was uh, in the weeds and I. And in the days where you make a DNS screw up and you have to live with it for a while yeah. and realize, yeah. until things resolve and yeah. and I never I want to go back. And so once, you know, you guys laid that foundation, I was like, I just fully I, I respect what you're doing. But then the encryption, making mm -hmm. the encryption piece is another you're just like, you know, I, I get certs and I but I don't want to mm -hmm. live in that world. I want to do what right. I do. But right. and then you guys have been doing this incrementally. I mean, some of the edge, the runners, the um, what you, you, how you guys perceive serverless. I mean, that maybe is another show, but yeah. you guys jumped on the API management train recently. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I want to hear why. What's the story behind it? What, how do you guys see all of this? Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and uh, uh, I'm just laughing at your, your utilization of those those slash uh, 24s that you had. You know, the, those probably appreciate uh, these days faster <laughs> than Bitcoin. So I don't know if you, you still have them, but uh, worth a lot. I think <laughs> they're quite expensive these days. Um, I used to. Yes. Uh, Administer buying four and eight when I was the student manager of the, the network operations center in college. So I know the pain. We had a very flat slash 16 for the entire campus. And so 
uh, things have changed there, but but uh, know, know the pain managing DNS. There's a great um, T-shirt that says, you know, it, it was DNS, right? It's always DNS when, when something goes down. So, um, yeah, so, I mean, just, just to give a little background before I jump into kind of why we entered this space, you know, some of the things you mentioned, issuing, you know, SSL, TLS certificates, um, managing DNS, you know, th- those are things that just have to be done and have to be done well and reliably and securely. And that's not really core to what most people do, unless you're running an infrastructure company and providing that for others. That's something you just kind of have to do to, to run your business. And so we try to take care of as much of that as possible to let you focus on building and growing your business and, you know, the business logic and the things that, that only you can do well versus, you know, things that we can kind of take off your plate. And so we like to think about the company as helping build a better internet. And so we're, we're essentially built this massive global network that spans the world. I think we're in uh, 250 cities and over a hundred countries now, and we're very close to the eyeballs for about 50, 50 milliseconds from 95% of the, the internet connected population. And so what we try to do to, to get to the API side is we want companies and developers to be able to just kind of plug into that network and, and automatically improve the security of, of everything they do online. Uh, and also the way we do it makes it more performant and reliable. You know, we started out focusing on on security and, and you know, Matthew, our CEO, likes to tell a story of customers would, would write in in the early days and say, hey, this is actually much faster now. Um, but that wasn't the original focus, right? We, we do do a lot on performance and we get a lot more into the to the networking side these days, but um, not not part of the, the original uh, outside for the company. And so we're in a mission to get to, to APIs. We're, we're in a mission to go ahead and go through all the boxes that, you know, you and I have probably back in the, the late 90s, early 2000s, got into a data center and, and racked and stacked, right? I, I, I enumerated some of them, the, the web application firewall, the load balancer, uh, DDoS scrubbing boxes, all, you know, I could go on and on. But one of the ones there that that people put a lot of logic in is some sort of, you know, load balancer or gateway that does um, things like TLS termination, does, does routing, does some sort of security function, rate limiting, et cetera. Um, and, you know, if you, if you have one of those running in uh, a data center and everything is there and you don't care about, you know, redundancy or being close to users around the world, that probably works okay. Uh, but a lot of our customers are running, you know, either multi-region in different cloud providers or sorry, the same cloud provider or uh, multiple cloud providers. And, and they use us at the edge to attract all their traffic, right. To, to those, um, to those pops that we have that I mentioned, and then perform as much of those operations you would typically do downstream in a data center at the edge. And so we, we, we've essentially taken all those boxes and written software to, to virtualize them. I mean, these days we're replacing, you know, if you're doing MPLS, uh, you know, I used to put, deploy that back in the day. You can do that now and just sort of uh, software functions we've written into to the stack at the edge. And so with APIs, uh, we wanted to, especially for customers that are already putting traffic through us for uh, reasons of, uh, protecting, you know, things against like just DDoS or volumetric attacks or even caching certain assets. That traffic's already passing through us, and so we've we've had customers come to us and say, "Hey, we'd like you to do." Initially, it was we'd like you to do more security functions, and so things like um, uh, you know, looking for uh, sequential abuse detection, and we can get into that. I think it's a really interesting topic. Or uh, we want to write rules that that use the intelligence that you're gleaning from, you know, those millions of sites that are running through you and uh, apply that and, and take different action at the edge. But more recently, it's it's customers coming to us and saying, hey, we're spending you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars on this in this API gateway solution and we're only using a very small fraction of it, right? And and uh, we'd love, given the traffic's already running through you, we'd love for you to sort of implement those those remaining functions that we are using so that we can simplify and, and consolidate uh, from a vendor perspective and uh, just, just deal with that at the edge and not have to worry about it downstream. Yeah, wow. I mean, there's, there's a lot to unpack there, I would say. So I've been following the API management game. I started my blog, API Evangelist, in 2010, was to understand the cloud and mobile, but uh, at the time, three scale Apogee, MuleSoft, all mm-hmm. of their kind of evolution. And they very much, they had this 
I don't know if it was vendor driven or analyst driven, but the notion was here's a whole suite of features that you need, a portal, mm -hmm. docs, all mm -hmm. of these things. And it was, and I consider it now, it's like our grandfather's gateway. It's just a massive trunk of like everything that you don't need, right. but you kind of accumulated it over the years. Yeah. And, yeah. and I find, and then you see this next generation of, Kong and Tyke and others emerge that like, hey, we need a smaller, lightweight gateway. Mm -hmm. um, but then as you, as these things kind of been commoditized, I would say 2015, things started being commoditized at the gateway layer. Some of those features are just essential that you talked about, mm -hmm. um, you know, routing, rate limiting, um, security, caching, these things, they're mm -hmm. fundamental core, but they're commodities now. They're not yeah. like you know, they need to just be baked in, they need to be there. And I kind of feel like that's reflected of, of Cloudflare's approach to things is, is once things reach that kind of essential grade need, you guys kind of abstract and simplify it. And it just becomes part of the fabric of, of the web. Yeah, that, that, that's definitely true for a, a lot of the functionalities where we're sort of building it into the, that engine at the edge, which sort of matches on requests. And, you know, we see about 32 million requests per second. So a lot, lot, lot of stuff to match on. And then sort of what action do you want to take on that? And, and how much information can we give you about the request itself, the session, the the user behind it, uh, uh and, and give you as much information as possible to, to decide what you want to do. And so those those mature functions, you know, those are quite simple to implement. I think where a lot of our focus now is, uh, is, is what are the unique insights that we can surface that you might not be aware of? And so if you're running a, a mobile application, uh, you know, that's calling APIs at the end of the day, right? That's calling APIs in the back end to, to perform certain operations. And so some of the really cool stuff that we're working on that I'm really excited for to go GA for customers, um, and we've done some some you know manual tests and shared some data. Are things that are looking at the the patterns of how people are using APIs and trying to surface for them what is you know what is anomalous, right? So take a take a food delivery app. This is a, is a real world example. Uh, I won't mention the customer by name, but what, what we were doing with them is we said, okay, let's let's take all that traffic passing through us. Um, let's see how many unique different API calls there are, and there was upwards of 100,000 because you've got, you know, unique identifiers and things like that that are part of the path. Can we normalize that down to, you know, remove those sort of unique identifiers and put some variable placeholders there? I think it was 60, 70 API paths ultimately that got called by their mobile app. And let's surface what what doesn't look right that you your security teams might want to dig in on, right? So if, if you're running an operation at scale, you you just don't you have so much data to sift through. Where do you spend your time? How do you triage? And so, what we did there is we built these Markov chains that said, what is the probability to move from you know state one to state two to state three to state four or all the states that we we identified? And you know if, if you're using a food delivery app, uh, you'll open the app and you'll see you know a list. You log in right. You'll see a list of restaurants that are delivering to your home. Uh, you might scroll through, pick one, you know, see the items, uh, add a few to it. And then if you're like me, you change your mind and you go to a different restaurant and, you know, clear your cart and add some other items and eventually place an order, right? And that's that's sort of the behavior that most people will navigate this API through. They're, they're not really aware they're calling an API, but their, their mobile application is. But what you wouldn't do is you wouldn't log in and then enumerate every single restaurant and every single price uh, in a very short period of time, right? Or even just do that regardless of the amount of time. And so uh, in this particular case, the, the customer of ours, their hypothesis was that this was actually a competitor running their mobile app in a emulator, right? To try to get around some of the, the security controls. And so we were able to service that insight for them by running this uh, against our, our uh, markup chain models. But uh, this is something that we're working to automate now. So that's where I'm really excited. Like the basic stuff you mentioned, that's commoditized. Anybody can do that. The, the, the harder stuff that's more useful and sort of reduces time for security teams and development teams is, is where we want to focus. And I'll just give you one, one example on the development side. So that was a security example. 
we've got this product, Cloudflare Workers, a uh, serverless product where you can run, uh, you know, code around the world. And so we have the concept of a, uh, we, we like to say the region is global, right? And where you don't pick anything. It's just you, you write some code, you push it to us, it runs on every machine and every data center around the world. And those, um, those, those paths initially were, can you modify the functionality of what Cloudflare does, right? So Cloudflare doesn't have a button to do this. Can we, can we tweak it to do that based on, you know, writing JavaScript and, and using the, you know, V8 isolates uh, that, that, that Google and, and Chrome developed? Um, that was the initial use case. But, but today, most people are writing um, that are coming to this from a developer perspective. They're writing their applications. You know, they're shifting from running them in, a, in, in AWS to, you know, in, in a handful of data centers to running them at the edge. And they're implementing APIs there, right? And so how can we, if, if we're seeing this traffic pass through us, how can we say, hey, this is something that, that maybe we could run much quicker for you at the edge and, and maybe generate some boilerplate code or some scaffolding that you could modify to hook a request and a response object? So, so some of that more intelligent stuff is what I'm really excited about. I think that reflects what I'm seeing. I mean, the last... Uh... The grandfather's generation of API management was SOA, service-oriented architecture, web services, mm -hmm. very, very mm -hmm. top-down heavy. Mm -hmm. I consider the second wave about these these restful resources that we needed, you know, images, videos, messages. But it's very, I don't know, crud. You, you take your database, you create, read, update, delete. It's very yeah. resource-driven. But what I'm seeing, the next generation of APIs is very capability or as you say behavior based it's <laughs> it's these are the these are the the series of api calls against many resources internal partner and external that we need these these capabilities are what we're putting out there and then the resulting behaviors on top of that that's huge that's a gold mine of data for me um as a as an api producer to kind of stay in tune with the feedback loops i need for mm -hmm. from my consumers yeah, that, that feedback loop is, is, is a great point, and that's how we think about how, how do we surface insights. So we, we launched something that we call the Cloudflare Security Center. Not, not the most unique name. There's a lot of security centers out there, but it, it shows you insights into uh, where should you be paying attention to. So, you know, basic things like is there a dangling A record or whatever. But we're trying to we're, – we're really kind of tightening that feedback loop for, for API saying, hey – we're calculating the P, you know, quantiles, the P50, the P90, the P99 request rate, and then we see these outliers for you on, on this volumetric detection. Click here to deploy a rule that already includes those thresholds that we've calculated for you. And so that kind of feedback loop of, of insights that by us seeing, you know, the, the, the traffic flow, we, we can make easier for you so you don't have to figure out, right? Those are the things that um, we, we want developers writing, writing code and building their applications. We don't want them worrying about how do you expose and protect and, and log and audit them and that sort of thing. And so that's as much as possible we have these conversations with uh, the developers and the, the DevOps crews that are uh, managing these APIs and saying, you know, what, what are these things we can take off your plate? And that's, that's largely... Uh, beyond sort of the, the basic stuff we talked about, a lot of our roadmap is what can we take off your plate and let you focus on building your business? Yeah, keep them focused on on the value they 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 develop mm -hmm. against and everything else. I mean, that's like what I was saying with DNS and with encryption. Like, mm -hmm. I know this stuff and I can live in this world, but yeah. man, I yeah. need to be building other things and doing other things. So the, you know, the one thing, the the global company platform that, that you you all have built. And I'm mm -hmm. assuming the reason why people want um, regions availability in all of these regions is performance. But are you seeing any sort of regulatory data yeah. sovereignty, other mm -hmm. motivations creep into this? Absolutely. Yeah. So I think that the, the regions you think about are there's, you know, and, and actually to go back to the SSL uh, TLS point, we did this originally for um, for encryption, and so we had customers tell us, "Hey, I only want my traffic decryptable in the the U.S. or I only want it outside the U.S. or in the European Union." And they had sort of very, or, or actually these specific sets of data centers uh, of your you know 250 plus cities. And so we built this was sort of the first thing we built was uh, we can build 
we can build this thing that we call keyless SSL, which is kind of a misnomer. Obviously, there's a private key somewhere, but where that private key is held is controllable by the customer. And so um, mm -hmm. we can route traffic to get to particular uh, data centers or regions to decrypt it. And that's kind of expanded over the years. We have something, uh, it's like a data localization suite. And so this particularly comes up about half of our business is outside the U.S. as a global company. And so I spent a couple of years in our London office and, you know, would meet with customers regularly, especially in Germany that would say, hey, I, I want, you know, this traffic not to go to certain parts of the world. And I understand that it may be, you know, slower uh, if you're accessing it from Australia or from the U.S., but I care more about sort of data sovereignty and, and you know, and, and related concerns. And so we can do a lot of cool stuff because we're running essentially a, a programmable network and we're writing all this stuff in, uh, you know, in the Linux kernel, Express Data Path, eBPF functions. Like we can do, we can program our network in a way that, that, that others can. And so we're able to, say, attract traffic only to particular um, IPs or IP prefixes in certain parts of the world. And so by default, uh, if, if you put something on Cloudflare, you know, your, your site, for example, will announce those, um, somebody does a DNS resolution request, the IP returned is the same IP wherever you are in the world, right? And so uh, we use IP Anycast technology. We're announcing those prefixes to our peers to say, you know, uh, I'm in Austin, Texas right now. And so if I do a resolution for your site, it's, it's going to hand back an IP and my ISP is going to route me um, to, to our Dallas data center, right? That, that's like a, probably a single hop away in terms of we're, we're peered directly Google and you know, my ISP and Cloudflare are, are probably peered in that data center. And so it's going to take me there. But if that data center falls out, out, you know, maybe we're doing maintenance, we're shutting it down. The Google is going to see my ISP is going to see what's the next hop I can get to. Right. And so that's the default behavior. But sometimes people want to say um, only serve these IP addresses or announce them from particular regions and countries. And that's a lot of the power for for you know workers, for example. So we, we thought initially it was going to be the hypothesis was. Um, you know, you can move your code to the edge and it's going to be that much faster. And if you're 10, 20 milliseconds away from somebody, you can do all these real time things that, you know, you wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And actually, a lot of that, uh, a lot of the use cases and where we're seeing a lot of the demand is really on that data localization side, adhering to the changing regulatory framework and saying, I only want to process this here. And we know you have data centers in these countries that we, we need to keep the traffic in only process them there. So that that was, you know, when you're in product management, you you have these ideas in your head uh, when you write the blog post, what people are going to use it for, and then they, they use it for something totally different, right? And it surprises you. And, and that's that's a cool experience and, and uh, it's a rewarding experience. Yeah, it feels like I had a did a show a week or so ago with uh, the CEO of Open Collective. So they're the funding model behind a lot of open source projects. Mm -hmm. And they're really building in, a lot of the other scaffolding that, that open source projects needs to run a business, to uh, do invoices in different countries and operate as open source globally. And I've always felt like that's what, what Cloudflare has been doing for me is is just abstracting away a lot of these global concerns that, that I have. I just don't have the time for it. I don't have the time. I'm a small small shop, small business, busy in my enterprise. And yep. so you all are abstracting away, like I said, the DNS, the encryption, but then these other regulatory, like I just don't have the time to, I get European Union, but Germany versus France versus mm -hmm. UK, I don't have time to think about all these things, but right. I have Is to. the UK in, in the EU or not? Right? And like, <laughs> yes. it's, it's, yes. it's not, it changes, right? And so we have a phenomenal uh, public policy team that is, you know, is, is global and, and they're just constantly monitoring this. And again, the goal is to, to monitor it and, and, and pick it off your hand so that you don't have to do it. Um, I think the, the, the cool thing about the uh, localization that, that we're doing and a, a lot of these ideas come initially from our team internally. And so, you know, we, we uh, will meet with different teams and they say, hey, you know, we, we're using this. Uh, third party solution today or something that, you know, we kind of cobble together internally, but this might be a good product for uh, our customers to use. Right. And, and we've got some seeds of it and we think that, um, you know, we should maybe build it in a, in a way that others can use. And that's where a lot of the ideas come from. So one, one example is the API discovery that we're doing. I sat down with uh, with our, our CISO uh, 
and tried to get some ideas and said, he said, Hey, when I was at, when I was at Uber, the, the first thing I was, was concerned about when I joined is what are all the APIs that are out there that, that my developers are publishing that, that I might not be aware of, you know, and, and, and to the world. And so we, um, we said, great, let's, let's kind of automatically catalog those for you so that you can actually uh, apply security policies to them and, you know, be aware of, of performance and sort of what data they're returning. And, and then, and then we also had internal folks say, "Hey, I'm worried that my APIs might, you know, return something I don't want them to." And uh, so then we built the ability to inspect that traffic as it as it goes back to the caller and say, "You know, are there certain strings or patterns you want to match for and block?" Um, another example there is, you know, we had uh, our dashboard. So, so people try to credential stuff the dashboard, right? They'll they'll download. Uh, you, you probably are on, you know, have I been pwned? You probably got emails from from Troy Hunt before if, if you're subscribed there. Uh, some company leaked, you know, some credentials you had, and people will gather those up and they'll start running those and trying to to hit. Um, Hit our APIs in our dashboard, and so what? We, what? What the the team that manages that internally said is, "Hey, can you help us? You know, they may be flying under a rate limit and not tripping that, but can you help us identify when someone's trying to log in with credentials that have been exposed somewhere on the internet, right?" And so we yeah. have a way where customers can opt in and say, "Hey, if somebody's using their credential that that you know is, is dropped in one of these databases, either just block it outright from that API authentication call." Or what a lot of people want to do is they want to add a request header so that when it goes downstream to their you know, origin server, they can decide what to do. So maybe they'll serve an additional form of authentication. Maybe they'll send a password reset, right? And so we try to kind of give you those signals in the API call flow to, to, to take additional action downstream if you want or at the edge. Yeah. the One of the first things I stumbled on with Cloudflare that that tripped me up, but then now is is a bedrock cornerstone is is the analytics so when i w- was first running all of my applications and websites and, and properties through cloudflare i had google analytics running and i was very much in a google mindset and then you switch to the the cloudflare analytics and you're looking at me and it tells a different story and at first i was like hey this just seems wrong and i even had some some conversations with you your mm-hmm. teams about it and they're like well it's a different view of the landscape and over time i realized how Behold, and I'd become to the Google performance of analytics mm-hmm. that's very yeah. advertising driven. And yeah. I, I was, it was like frog cooking in a pot over time with every change. I was kind of more and more and more behold. And, and then Cloudflare has given me this entirely honest view of the network. And I realized me, like, I don't care about page views in a vanity kind of ego way. I care about my properties and what's going on. And, and I'm, I'm definitely a technologist. So I have a different view. I don't look at Google analytics anymore. So I can see this when it comes to the API management layer. Like I feel like my API management analytics have been lying to me or <laughs> lying is a strong word, but yeah. leading me down a specific yeah. narrative. Yeah, no, that, that, that's a good point. And, you know, just to spend a second on, on analytics, I think, uh, we have this. We have all this data, and, and we've been really in the last couple of years. Uh, to your point, like we, we've been investing heavily in, in, in sharing out this data to give you the insights you need, and but doing it in a privacy-preserving way, right? And so some of the, the critiques you'll see with things like uh, Google Analytics and you know their recapture service, for example, is Google's just gathering and hoarding all this data so that they can you know sell you advertising, right? And so. Whenever we try to, this is a kind of a core principle of, of Cloudflare. Whenever we try to build a product, we think, how can we help uh, the end user become more secure and private in particular and, and sort of how they're accessing, accessing this? And so um, the difference there, of course, is, you know, a lot of the, the browsers will block. Um, uh, I use Brave, you know, a, a Chromium version that's kind of privacy focused. It'll block a lot of those uh, by default, you know, outbound calls to third parties that are kind of capturing your data, right? And so the difference is, in this case, the, the data is hitting Cloudflare, right? For, for requests to land there, we're in sort of a different vantage point to be able to gather it than some JavaScript that was added to the page. And um, uh, that, that's kind of how we think about it. And then the, um, the other thing is that JavaScript is, that's serving in a page, you know, that's a, that's a security risk to you, right? So uh, Java, you've probably heard of like mage part style attacks where somebody... 
um, is gets access to or supply chain attack gets access to some JavaScript that's running in your browser, makes a change, and all of a sudden, you know, the data you're sending in that your credit card number is going to the to you know to the um, attacker server versus where you intend it to go. And so we're really trying to focus on like reducing the JavaScript that's actually served in the browser and monitoring for changes and letting people know. Um, when, when that does. Anyway, we're getting a little out of the, the API world. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, a, 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 I think, a really neat um, part of, of JavaScript kind of surface reduction there. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense. And I feel like the complexity of our of, of the systems that we built, both internally, partner and external, the SaaS services we're using this. Uh, everybody I go to and talk to, I go into enterprise organizations. I, I went into the IRS and had this, uh, did an all day workshop. No one knows where all their APIs are. Like nobody I talk to can right. tell me where they, and I go, well, do you have an API catalog? And they're like, yeah, yeah, we've, we've got IBM this, or we've got Apogee this, or, but it's not up to date. Right. Um, we, we just yeah, move we too fast. Yeah. Think, yeah, exactly. And we can't get teams to update the metadata and it's just out of date. So our documentation mm -hmm. suffers, our security suffers, our perform yeah. all these things suffer because of this. And and us in the API space, so, well, you got to go design first and you build this contract and then everything will downstream will magically work. And that doesn't work either. Like we're just moving fast and we're very often breaking things and we're just responding to business needs and customers. And so do you feel like that automation and the intelligence that you talked about is like the only way we're going to be able to manage this chaos and get it to any sort of state that that suits our business needs. Yeah. I mean, automation is uh, if, if you don't automate something, it's going to fall the manual effort. And, and we think about that internally just for, you know, processes unrelated to this. If there's, if there's a human involved in actually uh, onboarding a customer for whatever reason, you know, take, take that network product I mentioned earlier, uh, initially, if you want to take your IP space, imagine you still own those class fees, and you wanted to announce them at the at our edge and attract traffic there, that's a project called uh, product called Magic Transit. If you wanted to do that early on, it was a bunch of humans involved, and and potentially there could be steps missed. You'd have to talk to the networking team to you know prepare the routers, and you'd have to talk to the uh, you know the SRE team to do various operations on what we call metals, all the servers and the data centers. And steps would get missed, right? And so we uh, had a concerted effort, the, the the product manager and that team, to drive that, the, all automate that stuff, right? It's not 100% automated, but it's pretty close. And so I, I see the same thing in talking to customers that are building and, and running APIs. If you don't automate it, things are going to get missed. And that's just human nature, right? We're we're not machines. We're, we're going to make mistakes. We have time commitments and crunches. And so... What are those things that we can automate for you? One, one good example is a lot of our customers like to validate the schema of a request, right? Using open API format uh, when the request comes in. And so um, some of them have great tooling that their system will automatically upload, uh, update those, those schema files and, and push them to our edge. Others don't have great tooling yet. They, they want to get there eventually, but it's not something they have just yet. And so how can we try to automatically do that for them, right? So the, a lot of the ways we build product is we give you the controls and the levers initially if you want to solve it yourself with uploading your schema file. And then we think, okay, how can we do better than that? What can we do next? Can we automatically identify, hey, it looks like this, this API contract has changed. Can we just let you confirm it and have us, you know, maintain that schema file for you, right? And, and those are the types of things that we think about in the API world. What are those other uh, manual steps that, that you would typically take and, and how can we take those off and, and automate them for you? Yeah, huge. That's so huge because that that rate of change that reflects the reality on the ground. And and mm -hmm. I just can't keep up with it. I need <laughs> I need and you that's my own system, my own APIs. But you're all also bringing in your wider security knowledge and 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 vi view that you guys have of the entire landscape, and building that into the intelligence and automation at that layer as well. Yeah, and, and things are getting harder, not easier on the on the security front. And there's there's this kind of trade off between privacy and security, which is really interesting. You may have seen the um, the Apple iCloud Plus you know private relay announcement, right? Where uh, your your phone is now sending uh, through a series of proxies and uh, to the end sort of 
server that's running the API, it's it's getting a lot of requests from the same API or a small pool of APIs that that used to be individualized identifiers, right? Used to be able to say, okay, well, this IP is doing something that is uh, suspicious and maybe we should block or challenge it. And, and this IP is only, you know, we've only seen good traffic from it. But all of this stuff is blended together in the name of privacy, which we're huge fans of and, and we support wherever we can, but that makes it harder to kind of disambiguate the, the caller to the API and, and perform security actions like rate limiting, for example. And so um, there's new approaches that, that need to be taken to advance those security efforts. And so we're spending a lot of our time on uh, open protocols that, that will help with this and um, things like you know, device attestation and, and other sorts of signals that can be sent in lieu of this IP as this reputation, right? And, and those are things that uh, there's open standards for a lot of this stuff. And if you had all the time in the world, it might be a fun project to, to go implement yourself and, you know, and, and, and do this and, and get this stuff. But um, again, you're, you're, you don't have that time. And so uh, we want to make that, we, we, our CEO constantly pushes us to, you know, and our CTO to make it magical, right? Like make it just work without, in an ideal world, the user doesn't have to do anything. And so that's the SSL uh, certificate issuance that you talked about before. As soon as we're authoritative for your domain, we can make an API call to a certificate authority, uh, ask what we need to do to, to, to demonstrate control of that, those DCV records, issue a certificate or multiple typically, and, and push it to the edge. And so that's something you don't have to do anything for, right? We want to do the same things for for APIs and, and, and other aspects of our product. And so um, that, you know, that use case where you're, you're seeing a bunch of clients coming from fewer IPs, can we automatically make our rate limiting work so that it, it, it doesn't need to rely on IP addresses? It can it can look more to the session. Th those are areas of, of focus for us these days. Like that. I, it, it says a lot that I, I still remember my IP block. So 207-189-150 through 254. Uh, <laughs> I still, after 20 years, um, typing yeah. those IPs so much. Yeah. I know um, the feeling. You uh, were one three nine one four zero slash sixteen was the uh, the <laughs> one I used to administer. So, <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, wow, yeah, all the the trauma and PTSD from those days. I definitely, I mean, Cloudflare has saved me so much pain and suffering, and so I'm really impressed and fascinated with what y'all have done at the DNS layer. Because I mean, back in the day, I mean, DNS is an important link in the chain, but. You guys took it to a whole nother level. I didn't, you know, all the edge stuff, all the, the serverless view, like I just never imagined the, the, this being such a rich layer of our reality security. So when it comes to prioritization at, at this API gateway level, what is, I mean, security obviously is probably top performance. Mm -hmm. Like when it comes to customer needs, what are those top, top, top requests or needs? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and this is kind of the, the fun part of uh, uh, being in product. You spend a lot of your time. Uh, and the way I like to tell it internally is you could do, you know, some people think of product externally. You're having like a thousand different conversations with prospects and customers and you're talking to a bunch of different analysts and you have this like perfectly ordered list of priorities that in an ideal world will solve everything for everyone. And then you kind of march through it sequentially. That's not really how it works in the real world for us is, is we typically will, um, what, I, what I love about us is we'll put out announcements very early and we'll release products early in the life cycle of the product. And, and mm -hmm. you know, when I joined seven years ago, that was a little uncomfortable for me. I was coming from, you know, financial technology world where you wouldn't ship something until this was, 100% fully complete and, and feature rich. And, um, and, and, and we like to give stuff very early in the process to customers because we want them kicking the tires and telling us, you know what, uh, you implemented it this way, but we actually think, you know, it would be better that way. And then you have a number of those conversations and you say, you know what, they're right. You know, we had this idea in, in these planning meetings and when customers started using it, it was different. And so that's how we approach a lot of the product prioritization where we'll make an announcement, we'll have some features customers can use, and then we'll do a bunch of discovery calls where we're getting on the phone and, and you know, asking customers, what problems are you trying to solve? And then we're writing those down and, and typing notes up. And then to, to get to your point of like what actually people care about, a lot of it is just the, the, the discovery process of 
um, first finding what's out there and then guiding them through that process, right? So you, you, you might be implementing just the 20 or 30% initially that, that really matter to people that they willing to pay for. And, you know, the other stuff they're not even using to your grandfather's trunk, you know, point earlier, you're accumulating all this stuff, but, um, you know, you're, you're, you're building that and you're building it in a way that's really easy to, to use, especially if your traffic is already running through Cloudflare. And so we're trying to say, what, what are the strengths that we can play to, to get people using our products and getting feedback on it. And so, so discovery is one of them. And then the, um, we like to think about reducing on, on the security topic. How can we reduce the noise as much as possible to only send the request to your origin that you want to see, right? And so the first layer of that is, you know, we think of it like a funnel, right? The, the first layer of that is just get rid of the, the network layer DDoS stuff, right? You know, if you're only exposing TCP 443, uh, on your origin, um, or or even not exposing anything and using our, our tunnel product to, to get it there, um, you don't want to see traffic, you know, hitting that yeah. that API endpoint coming from uh, you know, UDP traffic or uh, TCP on on different ports and protocols. And so that's kind of the focus in the security side is is progressively reducing the noise. And so um, volumetric DDoS rate limiting, schema validation. How can we only send to you what what really matters? And then a lot of the the other uh, needs are sort of opportunistic or, or the features are opportunistic. And so within our WAF product, we've been working on the concept of, of managed lists, which are you know lists that we maintain. We'll go out and scan the Internet, find all the open socks proxies, for example, that are out in the Internet or the, the VPN you know, servers that are out there and Tor, Tor exit nodes and you know malware C2 servers and, and all that stuff. And. If we can kind of uh, go and scan and maintain that list for you, and then within your API gateway config, you can say, hey, if a request is coming from, a, you know, behind a VPN, I want to treat it differently. Or if a request is coming from an open, you know, residential proxy, which typically is indicative of a compromised, you know, device. We saw a massive attack uh, not too long ago from these micro tick routers that got compromised and were able to be used in a uh, HTTP proxy way. We, we, we got hit with this, or one of our customers did with a 17 million request per second attack. And so how do we block that uh, from you know using intelligence there and just filtering the noise out? And then where, where from a priority perspective, we're, and so just to go back to the, the discovery point, we have these conversations with customers we implement what we need to get them successful and get them up and running. And, and we like early adopters, like the like Postman, for example, would be a terrific, we want really um, smart engineering organizations that we can partner closely with. And, and we like to think, uh, uh, or they like to think of us as an extension of their own internal development teams. And, and, and we love those sort of early adopters because they help us build great products. And so that's where we're focused right now. The, um, the other things are, are taking those, um, uh, routing engines and response engines and all the stuff we've built into what we call transform rules and packaging them up in that experience to, uh, you know, go from discovery to having a policy. And then the, the last piece where we've heard a lot of requests on are, how do you know if your APIs are, are healthy, right? Um, how do you actually know, are they under too much load? Uh, did I push a change that makes it a much more expensive call than, than it used to be? And so, Looking at, uh, we've heard, I'd love to get your perspective here, too, on how you think. I, I use this as part of a little discovery call, but uh, w what actually means an API is, is struggling? Is it a, mm -hmm. a P90 mm -hmm. response time spiking by X percent, right, for that sort of mm -hmm. longer tail of slow calls? Uh, or, you know, or something else, right? Is it a rate of five XX errors that are coming back or spiking? And so those are the things that, again, pointing out the, the where you should spend your limited time that, that we're focused on right now. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, first off, I love your your product uh, management kind of centric approach is this is the top thing that we're working with large enterprise customers on is that journey you described. They're, they're super risk concerned and, and, and they don't want to they don't understand that the, the confidence that come with a product ma management mindset with putting something out there, having those feedback loops in place. So a API product management, uh, treating your APIs as a product is the top kind of area we're working with large customers on. And, and part of that feedback loop is directly with your customers, having that feedback loop and, and having that confidence that you can put things out there and get the feedback you need. But the analytics 
the money, you know, who is this something they'll pay for? Is this, you know, what's the volume of usage? And so it sounds like you guys have a very healthy view of this, but it sounds like you're also going to extend that as part of your gateway so that others can put out APIs confidently early on, get feedback, iterate fast, move quickly in the way they need to and, and, and have not just, I mean, it's up to them to have the feedback loop with their customers, but they have the analytics, the awareness, the intelligence that they need to, to make the right decisions. Yeah, that's a great point. And, and putting it out and letting them sort of quickly get that feedback and not have to build in a lot of that telemetry and, and instrumentation mm -hmm. and, you know, just getting the logic running and letting us tell you, okay, here's, here's what we see happening from, from our vantage point. The other thing I'll mention is when, you know, yes, we serve a lot of, of, of very large enterprises, but uh, a lot of the really fun customers to work with are the ones that are either paying us nothing or $20 a month or $200 a month. And I interact with a lot of them on, on Twitter. And, <laughs> and I pay you uh, $75 a month for my personal stuff. Well, uh, we love it. And so a lot of the, 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 the sort of the richest feedback we get is from the, those what we call, you know, self-serve or pay as you go customers that aren't mm -hmm. associated with a, a salesperson or a customer success person. And so they write some of the, the most useful feedback and, and that's the kind of the beauty of, of having this uh, freemium model is that you have this long tail of millions and millions of sites and people are doing things that are uh, unique. And we actually see attacks against some of the smallest customers that are some of the most sophisticated attacks. And then we can learn from those attacks and then uh, put that back into the product, typically in an automated fashion. You're, you're training machine learning models to protect the biggest customers. Right. And so that's um, that's a lot of I, I put out when we're launching a new product or getting ready. I'll just send a, a tweet out saying, hey, anybody interested in giving feedback on X, Y, or Z or wanting to get beta access to something? And and there's just a, a really rich community that is excited for new products and, and is always willing to share their feedback. And, you know, if you're if you're involved in those early conversations with our product team, you have an opportunity to, to kind of shape how the actual product gets delivered in a way that is is more useful for you, right? And so um, – would, would love uh, anybody listening to this, if you, if you see us uh, putting out a new product, you know, re reach out on Twitter, uh, drop drop an email. We're always always happy to, to take feedback from all over. Well, my um, so I run open, our open tech team, which is our DevRel developer relations, about 10 of us. And then I have what's called our platform team where they focus on lifecycle and governance. And then I have a open tech team, which is specifications, Swagger, open API, async mm -hmm. API. Uh, and the standards and tooling around those. So they're on, they're on this. We're going to be playing around hacking, but you're, so the meeting I had before this was we're, we're kind of writing a state of the, the gateway kind of reality. Mm -hmm. Like where are gateways right now? They've been commoditized for about six, seven years. Who, what's the current list of players? What's the future look like? And, and you, what, what, what you've all just released is, is, is going to be a big part of that. So I'll have lots of feedback, lots of thoughts from our team. We'll, 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 connect offline but what's i know you guys are just getting going but what do you, what's the roadmap look like what can you share about where you're headed next yeah so we we've you know we've had a security focused api product for a while and so a lot of what we're doing now is the the management side of it and so mm -hmm. uh some of the stuff i talked about kind of that those those routing engines and transformations and being able to get get richer analytics other areas we're focused on are like, what are the other protocols that, that people care about? I mean, most, most of the traffic is, you know, sort of restful traffic, but we do have people coming to us and say, you know, I want to do, uh, my clients and partners are all calling these, you know, restful at the, the edge, but I want to turn around and, and transform that, you know, sort of bridge that to, uh, you know, gRPC or GraphQL or, or other yeah. protocols that, that people are looking to implement. And so, you know, when we when we launch features, we, we pick kind of what is the largest use case to begin with to get people working on it. And then someone will come to us and say, here's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, you know, one of our customers said, I want to move to uh, gRPC, you know, binary format calls for most of my traffic, and they have a date for it. And that's hard to do if you're just kind of on the origin. You're going to spin up things and manage different configuration. But if we can do that, you know, transformation, go back to the workers' point in serverless, if we can give you those primitives within a programmable environment, uh, you can do a lot with with that without having to to change your code downstream, right? Or or maybe you route it to a different endpoint that's accepting gRPC or GraphQL in lieu of the, these RESTful calls. And so that that's a big area for us. And then the the kind of invocation of 
workers, putting putting workers in the gateway close together. I think this is going to be one of our superpowers where if you're going to call slash, you know, foo on an API, um, yeah, you can send that downstream. But if that's logic, especially as we build out our, our storage solution at the edge, uh, where you have richer sort of database capabilities uh, on our network, you can move more of that logic to the edge and, and be kind of cloud agnostic. And so the tightening that feedback where, you know, you can take a path and say, okay, run this worker or even a more lightweight version of it, right? Run this function and give an interface to make that easy. That's where a lot of the, the effort is going to be going into from a, a kind of bringing workers and API gateway very close together. Uh, and, and that's something I'm really excited about. The, the, that team is just the, the velocity of what they're shipping is is insane. And so, um, any anytime we can kind of uh, tie things together like that from a product perspective, opens up a lot a lot more use cases uh, for people to implement. Yeah, so exciting. So looking forward to working and staying in tune with this. Where we just went from a you know a synchronous. API client HTTP to we're now doing web sockets and gRPC and mm -hmm. trying to weave that into the whole postman. So you have everything you know about core postman, but now in these other realms. So let's keep comparing notes there. But I think yeah, the biggest failure of API management over the last decade is addressing API deployment. Most mm -hmm. people ask me, which API management provider should I use to deploy my APIs? I'm like, mm, that, that, that's really a tough question because they're not going to until recently. Most of them wouldn't. And so that question's always just kind of been left hanging and serverless, I think, is potentially reinventing that. But I think your all's approach, that 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 intersection of, of at the edge, I think is really, really important, important to the future, I think, of what is API deployment combined with management, combined with all of this, this multi-protocol, multi-cloud kind of approach. So looking forward. Yeah, I'm excited and we would love, we'd love your feedback, uh, get you access to the beta and your team and would love to hear uh, any, any thoughts you have and you've got a direct line for a future requests. So uh, let me know, let me know what we can add. We'll be in touch. We're big fans. So, um, wow. Well, I we went way longer than I think most of these shows go. We went almost the full hour. But uh, I appreciate your time today, Patrick. This has been awesome. Yeah, this has been a fun conversation. Uh, really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me on. Uh, we'd love to chat again in the future. Thanks again to Patrick for stopping by. You can find more about Cloudflare at cloudflare.com, and you can find Patrick on LinkedIn. You can subscribe to the Breaking Changes podcast at postman.com slash events slash breaking dash changes. I'm your host, Ken Lane, and until next time, cheers. Mm -hmm.